thank you Chris for organizing this uh, workshop. It's already very inspiring uh, and I think I can only add like to the main argument which is so clear to everyone here that it's an entanglement there which is like not only socially related but, con but constitutive. But I have perhaps another example to make that clear which goes a bit back in, uh, in before um, the other talk. Um, so my talk is about yeah, the entanglements between science, natural history museums, or one natural history museum here, uh, and popular culture taking the example of a paleontological expedition, the British Museum of Natural History launched in 1924 and which lasted till 1931, namely the British Museum East Africa Expedition. When the former colony, East uh, Germany, East Africa, fell into British hands after World War I, the British Museum of Natural History made plans to send an expedition to what was then Tanganyika territory, today's Tanzania. The goal was to unearth giant dinosaur remains around Tembakuru Hill, which lay some four days march north of, northwest of Mindy, in a small town at the coast. After the first, first field season. In December 1924, the Times reported that Louis Leakey, chief assistant of the expedition, has now returned with specimens, a collection of photographs, and a remarkable narrative. In my talk, I want to take a closer look at the use of these media and the role they play in making dinosaurs potential objects of scientific, colonial, and popular appropriation. What I want to show is how the material reconstruction of fossils for museum exhibits, their scientific documentation, and their artistic reanimation, be it pictorial or cinematographic, all aim at making fossils talk, or more precisely, making dry bones live. The British Museum East Africa expedition was not the first paleontological excavation in the area around Tendaguru Hill, but it was in fact a follow-up, I guess you all know it, um, of, of one of the biggest paleontological ventures at the time, executed by two German paleontologists and up to 500 African workers during the years 1909 to 1913. Taking advantage of uh, German colonialism, the Berlin Museum of Natural History unearthed and transported to Berlin over 20, uh, 225 tons of fossils, among them the bones of what eventually became one of the biggest mounted Dinosaurs in the world, Brachiosaurus Brankai, still standing in the main hall of the museum today. It is so, um, thus not surprising that the British Museum used the German expedition as a reference point. In fact, the first encounter with material from Tendaguru in London dates back to May 1912, so the last year of the German expedition, when the area around Tendaguru was still German East Africa and the Berlin expedition was still going on. The London section of the German Colonial Society invited Sir Arthur Smith Woodward, Keeper of Ge Geology at the British Museum, to give a lecture on the great finds of fossil bones in German East Africa at the Imperial Restaurant in London. The invitation gives some geological and paleological information about the Tenangu find, finds along with a request for the audience, don't do that, <laughs> to prepare for the talk in advance, namely to consult geological reference books and to visit the Diplodocus skeleton mounted in South Kensington. Text illustrations and exhibits thus serve as a kind of mixed, me mixed media model, a term that Lukas Riepel has used, in order to better visualize dinosaurs during the talk. In addition, Woodward's presentation was accompanied by lantern slides from the fieldwork at Tendaguru, and for these he had approached the Berlin Museum in a letter referring to photographs that he had seen in a German newspaper which he wished to replicate, and they were actually sent. He further asked for a plaster cast of one of the biggest bones found at Tendaguru yet, a, a humerus measuring more than two meters, two meter ten exactly. Indeed, a letter, proof, a letter proves that a cast of the humerus was sent and displayed during the lecture before it was later displayed at South Kensington. Woodward thus employed all the ingredients needed for making dry bones live, specimens, a collection of photographs, and a remarkable narrative. This last one, however, not being British yet, let's say. The two meter long humerus, the original one now, had already been in use before and for a kind of different purpose in Berlin. In 1909, and I guess you are going to talk more about that, a selection of bones suitable for public display at the Natural History Museum was listed, including the enormous humerus of Skeleton S. 
Two years later, in February 1911, the piece had been prepared, and it was just in time for a lecture of Wilhelm von Branca, head of the museum, uh, which was held at a fundraising meeting where the fossil was displayed in order to attract further donations for continuation of the expedition. And there can be a lot said, of course, about, like, let's say, men and bones and the scaling, but <laughs> I only show you uh, this as illustration. In London, a decade later, the plaster cast of the humorous entered the spotlight again and played a similar role for the British expedition. When after the war, the British Museum launched, launched plans for their own expedition in, in Tendaguru, the German excavation served as a validation and justification for the yet unrealized British venture. A supporter of the British expedition, a, a supporter of the British expedition thus states in the Times, we may reasonably anticipate a rich harvest of such fossils from East Africa and a consequent enrichment of the national collections at South Kensington. Former German excavations were thus supposed to guarantee future British success. But since the funds at the disposal of the trustees of the British Museum were inadequate for carrying out the work on the same scale, the museum's strategy was rather to be on the safe side in order to justify funding and guarantee quick results. The goal was simply to secure fossils already known within reach. Rather than further exploration, the excavation aimed at the collection of bones already exposed or stored and abandoned by the Germans when they had to leave because of the war. More precisely, the primary goal of the expedition is to, to obtain the bones of Gigantosaurus, which was discovered by the Germans a few years before the war, as states Sidney Hamer, di director of the British Museum, in a letter to the editor of the Times, appealing for financial support of the expedition. He further writes, the colossal dimensions of this creature may be appreciated by comparison of the well-known skeleton of Diplodocus in the reptile room at South Kensington with a plast of the humerus of Gigantosaurus in one of the paleontological galleries. Hence, at different times, both museums used the same objects for their rhetoric strategy as a means to mobilize financial resources. Or let's say nearly this the same objects since one was the original one cast acting more like a visual, let's say, promise or assurance for the museum's future finds. However, for the British Museum, the German expedition was not just a reference point, but also one of demarcation. Since the credit for the discovery of the East African fossils had already been claimed, the British Museum rather stressed the fact that scientific and popular dinosaur culture originated in Britain. Sidney Harmer reminded the, the readers of the times that dinosaurs were first discovered in England and that therefore st steps should be taken to secure specimens from this remarkable bed for the national collection. From that point, nationalism was used as an argument to claim, that East, to claim the East African territory as British, British colonial property, just as Wilhelm von Branca had argued in 1908, publicly emphasizing the importance of the finds not only for German paleontology, but also for the prestige of the German colonial empire. Like he said, he talked about national treasures and colonial trophies. But while von Branca's speech addressed a small, well-selected audience and managed to get large sums from just a few generous donors, the British Museum expedition aimed at mobilizing a wider public and therefore had to gain popularity. Appeals for funds were hence launched in the daily press repeatedly for every field season, sometimes even more. And that's why it was so important that Louis Leakey, after the first season, returned with specimen and co a collection of photographs and a remarkable narrative. Oh, that was the, yeah, the, so. Photographing, developing, printing, and sending pictures of the fieldwork was, you all know it, an essential part of not only paleontological expeditions. Documenting served as visual evidence of the progress made in the field as well as a means to popularize and promote the expedition. Therefore, many pictures showed the removal and transport of the fossils from the colonial African territory in order to be labored in the metropolis. Like this, like the ways are are often shown the transit ways. Photographs like this, illustrating the passage from the field to the museum, refer to a classic colonial topos, namely the passage from periphery to center. 
for the place for the place where dry bones are eventually brought back to life is the museum. In consequence, after the first crates arrived in London, the pictures of the field work were, co- were then accompanied by those from the work inside of the museum. This is still the field work, and this is one from the museum. Um, further illustrating the process of making dry bones live in the passage from the fossil bed to the museum, because this is exactly the title of an article from the Illustrated London News in um, 1925 by the keeper of geology, geology at the British Museum of Natural History. However, you might see it, although Bather refers directly to the Tanganyikan mm-hmm, expeditions, uh, expedition, the animal in the picture is an elephant, since the fossils from Tendaguru were, were not yet ready for mounting or even being pre- prepared. They still remain invisible in their materiality, only evoked by the text and visual substitutes. Here once again. Sorry. The same article in which Chief Assistant Louis Leakey photographi- photographically documented the working conditions and the document uh, and the condition of transport of Etenda Guru also included an illustration of living dinosaurs not drawn by Leakey, but by um, the wife of Arthur Smith Woodwards, the Keeper of Geology at the Natural History Museum. Oh, sorry. Where is it gone? Ah, here it is. Combining photographs and such images, <laughs> you have already shown it, um, was another very typical way of providing a live image of what in the field was still fragmentary material and fragmentary knowledge. It was thus another way of reanimating fossils. Placed in their supposedly natural environment, two dinosaurs can be seen, but not just any two. The article identifies them as gigantosaurus, visualized by a fossil hunter's dreaming, as I quote now, a fossil hunter's dreaming by his desert fire beside an unearthed humerus. The picture thus visualized the very process of making dry bones live by imagination. In a comment on her drawing, Alice Woodward notes, the fossil hunter who discovers gigantic fossils of creatures of the past must sometimes try to visualize the huge monsters to whom they belonged. In this phrase, visualization and imagination are clearly marked as part of the paleontological (coughs) practice in the field. However, the the dinosaurs here are not mere product of imagination, but its reconstruction is, according to the caption, based on scientific data from bones in Tanganyika. The unearthed bone in the picture from which the vision arises, so here, and from there, so the vision arises, uh, is identified as a humorous, and not just any humorous. Uh, rather, a reference is made directly in the article to the cast of the humorous in the paleontological galleries of the British Museum, with an, or, with an, ori- uh, with an origin dating back to the German colonial times. Thus, in an an imaginary natural space, the museum space, the humorous unearthed by the Germans now on display there, and the actual work site in the colonial African territory of Tanganyika are kind of juxtaposed, situating humans and dinosaurs in the same space and making prehistory and present day implode. Still in in the picture, the coexistence of humans and dinosaurs is only possible as a dream. What seems to be on the same page is therefore not an actual encounter. And this is about to change the very same year. This is my last point. The topics of Western adventurers discovering a surviving ancient human civilization located in a remote space was already common in mid-19th century in Victorian popular culture in what Noel Carroll has called the lost world or prehistoric world genre. But it was not until 1912, you all know it, Uh, that surviving ancient animals were introduced in popular fiction with Sir Arthur Arthur Conan Doyle's The Lost World, which was first serialized in London's Strand magazine before appearing as a book. Parallel to the afterlife of dinosaurs in the museum space, thus emerges the topic of surviving dinosaurs since the persistence today of plants and animals from the remote past are the premises of um, Doyle's story. In the novel, Ed Malone, a young reporter for for the Daily Gazette in London, accompanying an an expedition to the Amazon Bazaar Bazaar, uh, of South America, finds a jungle plateau where dinosaurs and other extinct creatures still survive. 
The lost world thus presents a space where humans and living dinosaurs coexist. After numerous adventures, the expedition, led by Professor Challenger uh, from London, um, returns to the metropolis with a collection, photographs, and a remarkable narrative. In 1925, First, Nation, First National Pictures released a movie, also very famous, of course, um, a movie adaptation of Doyle's book. The famous US movie was the first full length motion picture to feature dinosaurs, also called The Lost World. The 50 clay models of dinosaurs in the movie were created <coughs> by the sculptor Marcel Delgado, who based his models on paintings of Charles uh, R. Knight. So you can, of course, draw, draw all these genealogical lines. They were animated by Willis O'Brien in the silent black and white picture by stop motion photography. From the early 20th century on, thus the animation of living dinosaurs by cinematographic technology presented yet another technique of making dry bones live on the screen this time. 1925 was also the second year of the British Museum East Africa expedition, and again science museum and popular culture fused, providing a new way of popularizing the expedition. In February, the First, Na first National Pictures offered to donate 200 uh, 250 pounds to the Tanganyika Expedition Fund in exchange for a series of newspaper articles to be written by the director and scientists of the, of the British Museum. The articles were to appear close to the release of the film. From that point onwards, fiction entered the scientific space even more when Louis Leakey, after he was featured in the Times and the Illustrated London News, was approached to give a lecture about Tender Guru at Cambridge on February 25th, and convinced Virgin National Pictures to lend him a clip from their yet unreleased film in the interests of additional publicity. In turn, science entered the cinematic space when the Times announced that on the, cap on the opening night in London, Sidney Harmer, director of the museum, was to give a lecture on Cutler's work in Tanganyika territory before the screening. Hence, a real scientist taking Talking about a real expedition provided a framework for the expedition narrated in the film, thereby increasing its credibility while the film helped, helped rising the popularity uh, of the British Museum expedition, which was really much in need of uh, more public funding or private donations. Um, in, in linking it to a heroic, adventurous narrative in which hunting dinosaurs is linked, is linked to a hunt of living dinosaurs. Fictionalizing science by popular film and authenticating fiction by scientific expedition thus work hand in hand. The interplay between the scientific community and the ent entertainment film industry both place it in a kind of capitalist context. And my last point is, um, perhaps I even have to skip a little bit. Um, yeah, the film, yes. <laughs> Photographic capturing and the actual capturing of living dinosaurs are again linked in the film when the explorers return to London and Professor Challenger, to prove his claim, has brought back with him a brontosaurus to put it on display. Wherever, however, during the passage from the lost world to the modern world, from the periphery to the center, the creature's cage is smashed while being unloaded and the beast escapes. This is the moment where the metropolis becomes the new jungle, ruled by a wild creature out of control. After destroying several symbols of modern industrialization and civilization, Brontosaurus finally breaks down the tower bridge and falls into the Thames. However, the more buildings destroyed on the screen, the more powerful modern animation technology proves to be. This is the point that Anna Z has stressed in one of her papers. The, vi the visible destruction on the screen assumes the invisibility of animation technique. Actually, what the film presents to pre pretends to document is a mere product of its own technology. The fact that the dinosaur can feature as a wild beast in the narration of the movie, acting as a counterpart of modern civilization, is due to the progress in cinematographic technology. Hence, the destruction of London is able to mold it to symbolize wild, uncontrolled nature and technology control at the same time. If we now return one last minute um, to the British Museum expedition, we have already seen how the dinosaurs remain, how the dinosaur remains of the British uh, expedition were effectively popularized and visually brought back to life 
uh, in the media by phot photographs, drawings, and a strategic alliance with the film industry. Meanwhile, in the scientific and in the expedition, uh, ex exhibition context of the museum, the dinosaurs from Tanganyika remained largely invisible for most of the time. Although the time states in 1927, material for the reconstruct reconstruction of about 25 dinosaur, dinosaurs has been brought from Tanganyika, the museum had really difficulties in dealing with the mass of the crates that arrived at the museum over the years. The, in the final expedition report, internal one, it is stated, the unpacking of the boxes and the treatment of the bones made heavy demands upon the space and the time. No scientific report was ever published, and most of the material is still stored or even unprepared in the collection. What f was first made visible in the, in the mediated space of articles and pictures long remained invisible and thus kind of inanimate in the museum. So what I've tried to show is how dinosaurs in the early 20th century became potential objects of scientific, colonial, popular, and not at least commercial appropriation. But despite the entanglements between science, museum, and popular culture, the differences may not be ignored, especially comparing the cinematographic work on dinosaurs in the lost world and the paleontological work, work in the British Museum. While the unruly the dinosaurs on the screen were materially in control behind the screen, the fossil dinosaurs in the expedition, uh, in the, of the expedition like o these objects of visual appropriation already, turned out to be materially disobedient and thus proved to be the truly unruly creatures after all. Thank you.